Today's lecture is uh, in continuation to the previous one where we looked at the uh, importance of a very useful technique called pulse uh, laser deposition and uh, this has been one of the path breaking um, event in the uh, area of thin film technology where you can uh, translate most of the studies of bulk materials into thin films and not only to study in, in uh, lower dimensions, but also to uh, bring about lot of device applications into perspective, PLD has been a very uh, decisive method. And we have looked at some of the constraints, how sensitive this uh, process can be. And we also tried to understand the dynamics, especially the plume dynamics, how it affects the growth quality of these uh, <coughs> materials. Uh, today, I am going to concentrate on another equally competing uh, thin film deposition technique which is called pulse electron deposition. Um, the fact that we are replacing the word laser with electron suggests that the source of uh, deposition is going to be different. So, instead of using a pulse laser beam, we are going to use a pulse electron beam and uh, we can see why PED is more important that way and uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of PED over PLD. So, in this um, PED deposition which is fairly a new technique compared to PLD, we will look at how we can make thin film structures, nanostructures and uh, how this can be used for device applications. So, let us start with the uh, understanding what PED is pulse electron deposition is a, a process in which 100 nanosecond high power electron beam which is approximately of the order of 1000 angstrom uh, at 15 kilo electron volt penetrates of about 1 micron deep into the target and as a result there is a rapid ev evaporation of the target material and uh, this transforms into a plasma. So, once it is a plasma, it gets deposited on the desired substrate, which is actually a non-equilibrium extraction of the target material. And therefore, because of this nature of transporting the ions and uh, the uh, atoms, um, you can ensure a fully stoichiometric composition of the uh, plasma and that way we can make a single crystalline film. There are some uh, issues which act as strength for PED compared to PLD. Therefore, it is better we familiarize why PED stands out in many ways compared to the most established PLD technique. In contrast uh, to other techniques such as conventional electron beam evaporation, the main feature of this pulse system is the ability to generate a high power uh, density of 10 power 8 watt per centimeter square at the uh, target surface. So, you are actually uh, focusing this highly intense electron beam on the target and as a result thermodynamic properties of the target material such as melting point and specific heat becomes unimportant because you are overcoming all these issues by a high energy pulse and as a result you can evaporate any sort of material that you want. So, this is particularly advantageous in the case of complex and multi component materials where you have more than two or three metals then you do not know how these materials would respond to a pulse laser or to a pulse electron beam. You would see they behave in a more friendly way with PED technique. As in the case of PLD, PED provides a unique platform for depositing thin films of complex materials and therefore, it is very viable for applications and mass production and as a result, this is one of the scalable and uh, cost effective uh, high volume manufacturing process. We will look at several examples and understand uh, where it has a edge over uh, PLD. If you recap the previous lecture on PLD, you would see that the instrument itself is quite big uh, 
because you need to bring the laser uh, plume into the uh, vacuum uh, zone and as a result several optics is required and then you also have the big laser system which is going to occupy. So, uh, comparatively PED technique is a very very um, amiable process because even in lesser space you can try to install this system. As you would see here this is how the dimension of a PED and what is important in this uh, deposition technique is the pulsed electron source uh, which is uh, called PEPS source and uh, this is the core of the PED technique where the pulse electron beam comes from this. But for that the vacuum chamber and all the energetics are nearly the same like a PLD. So, what you do you avoid the complex uh, problem of maintaining a gas source for laser and then uh, the cooling systems plus the optics to guide the laser light into the vacuum chamber all these are avoided by just using a laser uh, electron source. So, this is a typical um, <coughs> way that you can uh, energize a material by shooting a pulsed uh, electron beam and the target is now uh, ablated and it causes this plume and then this plume travels to the substrate. Although the pulse electron beam looks very fancy and simple, but to take a closer look these are the elements that are involved. You have a hollow um, cathode uh, and this is focused on to the vacuum chamber. Uh, this is the vacuum chamber and this is your uh, PEP source. You have this uh, capillary tube which is usually a ceramic and then the hollow cathode here and uh, this is focused on the target. Uh, so, uh, critically although it is simple, but the um, making of the PEP source is a tricky stuff which is uh, the most important uh, element of a PED uh, chamber. Now, to get a, a quick look at the cost effectiveness between PLD and PED before you look at the examples of how the PLD and PED grown films look like, you can clearly see they stand out because it is almost one eighth of the um, cost that is required. So, if you are looking for a one energy source of a PLD, you may have to shell out nearly 400 K dollar of US dollars, whereas uh, PED is just 50 K. So, therefore, you can actually get more than 6 PED chambers uh, for installing one PLD chamber. So, cost wise it is very effective and therefore, it is uh, very useful for mass production and deposition station. So, PED costs just 10 percent that of PLD. Uh, if you quickly want to look at the dynamics where PED is different, when PED is in operation you would see a channel tube which is also flashing or illuminating during the process and this is nothing but the ceramic tube which is actually guiding the electron beam and this electron beam actually falls on this uh, target. This is the target which is of a, a typical 25 mm disc target. So, when, when the PED strikes then you can see this plume is uh, coming out. So, this is a typical photograph uh, during the operation process. So, the, the control of this plume and what is happening the composition and uh, the target which is mounted here perpendicular to the plume all this governs the dynamics of PED process and I, I either it can make it more novel or more detrimental to the film that is grown. So, this is all we are going to understand in the next few slides as to what are the critical parameters that govern this issue. Uh, when we talk about the specification of pulse electron beam source, uh, we need to understand uh, the critical advantage is that you have a pulse width of 100 uh, nanoseconds, um, which is comparably different to the pulse width of your uh, PLD process. And then the pulse energy range that you have is quite tunable, you can go from 0.1 to 0.8 joules. So, you can actually vary the strength of your pulse uh, 
by operating with a different uh, measure of uh, the energy of electron beam. So, when you talk about electron beam, you are going to operate from 8 kV to 20 kV. So, you can change 8, 10, 20, 12, 14, 16. So, with this the pulse energy also will be affected, but the pulse width will remain the same. So, you can actually tune this for a variety of substance including biomaterials to ceramics to metallic materials to insulators. You can play around with the energy of your electron beam and the pulse energy. Therefore, you can make a judicious choice to bring the right uh, mixture. So, these are some of the uh, specific uh, numbers that govern the PEP source and you can also see the, uh, the uh, beam cross section is pretty uh, sharp um, which is 10 into uh, 6 into 10 power minus 2 centimeter square. So, you can really spot on a very small area which means even with a 10 mm target you may be able to uh, do a PED deposition. What sort of materials that we can coat using PED as a thin film? Uh, the spectrum is quite large now and uh, you can see starting from a superconductor to a photonic material like zinc oxide uh, to a photonic material again tin oxide or to all these insulators or to polymeric substance um, to ferroelectric and uh, magnetic substances or metallic substances. You see a wide range of compounds that can be used. ITU of course, you know is the base material for any photonic applications. So, if you look at the uh, spectrum of materials that you have, you can actually play around with almost any material that is possible uh, through PED and what is the control? You can actually go for a deposition rate of 0.1 to 1 angstrom per pulse which is a very good choice. So, if you want a slow growth, you can affect a slow growth process. If you want a rapid um, deposition, you can do that. At the optimum distance between the target and the plume of say 6 centimeter, you can actually vary the deposition rate considerably. Now, the parameters that control uh, the film growth has uh, um, some numbers in it. So, when you are actually having a substrate which is your single crystal here and uh, you have mounted uh, mounted this uh, substrate perpendicular to the plasma. Uh, now, the energy of the arriving atoms here which is uh, in the end of the plume and the number of arriving atoms which uh, together these are n into E 1, they depend on the plasma energy balance and the electron beam intensity which is actually given as J in ampere, volt in kilovolt and time in second. So, uh, these three parameters govern what sort of uh, energy with which the atoms arrive at the substrate and the number of arriving atoms. So, this, uh, this is all it takes to control. Therefore, for every given material, you need to make sure that you have a proper energy balance because the way you try to ev evaporate zinc oxide will be quite different from the way you evaporate nickel for example, a metallic material. If you want to ablate aluminum oxide, then you need to have a proper energy balance. So, uh, depending on the uh, band gap of the target material and the energy balance that you choose, you can optimize the plume or the plasma flux. If you look at the electron beam generation which is actually coming from, uh, from a trigger and uh, you trigger it through a hollow cathode and it is actually coming to the vacuum chamber which is your anode. You would see uh, for a 20 kV pulse for example, if you provide a channel spark discharge for every pulse you would see the decay will be of this fashion this is for the voltage and then you would see the current going through a minimum and then coming down. And in this process, you would see the pulse width is actually full width of half maxima ranging to 100 nanoseconds. So, you have a very uh, narrow range where this uh, pulse width uh, is 
uh, of the order of 100 nanoseconds and uh, this is uh, the prime importance for the uh, PD process where you have a electron pulse which has a very very uh, sharp breakdown um, and the pulse width is uh, as close as 100 nanometer. So, with this pulse it is possible to almost bring about uh, many changes when the electron beam is actually hitting on the target surface. Therefore, when such a uh, high energy pulse is actually hitting the target. Now, you can look at um, how the materials get ablated. For example, the electron range which is actually a, a factor of V square um, electron range if you plot as a function of the uh, electron beam energy uh, you can actually keep on varying as you would see um, the operation are at higher voltages are not actually favored. So, anything beyond 14 although it can be done it is recommended that we do not um, strain the instrument by operating at very high uh, voltages and also you would see that the heavier metals are ablating much better compared to um, oxygen. So, uh, in case of silicon for example, the electron range is easily achievable up to 1 micron uh, even with 10 kV whereas, for uh, alumina and uh, yttrium barium copper you see substantially they are lower. So, if you are going for 14 kV it is very easy for you to achieve a uh, electron range of the order of 2 micron um, for an optimum uh, kV of 14 um, kilo volt. The target heating is actually more dependent on the electron range and uh, if we have a proper calibration for different materials then it is very easy for us to choose depending on the target to the plume uh, distance. With this um, electron range, uh, it is possible for us to determine the target heating because continuously this nanosecond pulse is hitting and this target heating range is nothing but um, a beam power over electron range. So, if you know the beam power and you know the electron range, it is possible for you to measure what is the target heating rate. So, depending on that if you make a plot you would see that it is not linearly varying rather it is actually going through a maxima. So, maximum heating can be achieved at 14 kV which is a very useful information. So, instead of struggling more at very high voltages if you can optimize for, uh, for this numbers then it will be uh, more efficient for you to do the ablation. We, in other words, uh, for this beam power and electron range, if uh, at 14 kV you achieve maximum heating, then we can try to bring down the other parameters like um, target uh, substrate distances closer, so that we can work at this efficiency. There is an optimal E beam voltage for uh, PED and that is what we see here. Uh, this is another useful uh, guidelines from uh, Neocera group which gives us some idea why PED may be much more efficient than PLD. For example, if you take a 248 nanometer laser krypton fluoride laser uh, and uh, use the PLD, uh, you would see uh, very comfortably we can deposit silicon carbide, titania, uh, strontium titanate. Uh, tantalum oxide and uh, silicon nitrate. These are very easily uh, deposited using a PLD instrument. Whereas, when you look at the band gap of some of these materials um, like yttria or zirconia or magnesia, silica, alumina, all these are showing um, a band gap above 5. And if your XMR laser can generate only 5 electron volt, it is impossible for you to ablate with ease this high band gap material. Therefore, this is where PED comes into picture. So, with PED you can actually uh, deposit any of the insulating compounds or compounds with very high band gap. So, that is one of the reason why PED still stands out as a more uh, prolific uh, 
deposition technique. With this in mind, at a distance between the target and the substrate of 5 centimeters, you can anticipate typical deposition rates of the order of 1.6 angstrom per pulse if you are going to deposit yttrium barium copper oxide which is a superconductor. If you go for ceria, you can easily ablate that. Calcium, cobaltite, alumina, silica, all this um, insulating materials you can easily ablate with a very high uh, deposition rate. Um, and you can also see that uh, the photonic materials uh, you can update, uh, ablate with fair amount of ease. And uh, uh, these are the metallic materials although the ablation rate is nearly uh, 10 times lower yet it is possible for you to ablate the metallic materials also. So, the type of materials that you have and the electron beam energy that you use with a fixed target to um, plume distance, you can actually achieve this sort of deposition rates. So, one should not think that anything and everything uh, operated with PLD will have the same deposition rate. So, it varies with the uh, system and how it takes up the um, electron beam. As you would see here, if this is your substrate and this is your gas zone and uh, this is your plasma which is generated at the interface with the target, you would see at 100 nanosecond, this is where the plasma is and the kinetic energy of your plasma or the ions that are generated is much, much higher than one electron volt. But as the plasma progresses towards the substrate, you would see in one microsecond, the kinetic energy is falling down and it is falling down much, much lower and then it becomes a thermally activated deposition. So, we should understand how the plume propagates and therefore, depending on the material, it is possible for us to fine tune the system. The flux dynamics is almost similar to PLD. Um, as you would see here, uh, in the first 100 nanoseconds when the, uh, when the pictures are taken, uh, this is your target, uh, this is your uh, target location and the way the plume propagates uh, this way uh, towards the substrate, you can see the plume is actually getting discharged or it decelerates uh, in gas so over a period of uh, the decay time. So, at 100 nanosecond it is just about to flush and then as you go down to 700 nanoseconds you can see how the plasma uh, decelerates in a particular gaseous environment. And you would also see this white region is the region where maximum uh, kinetic energy is there and it is still sustaining at 700 nanoseconds. So, with every pulse shot the pulse actually propagates in this fashion from here to here and then it goes and strikes on the substrate to form the thin film. Now, I will go to some specific examples, show you some thin films and also uh, draw some conclusions on plume dynamics and stoichiometry which might help us understand the, um, the dynamics of PED process. Uh, some of the examples are taken from the literature. One is from Nistor and co-workers who have worked on a variety of oxide films and they have made uh, quite a good amount of calibration. So, I want to touch on few examples from Nistor's group. Uh, this is nice image of the visible emission of hydroxyapatite which is a bone material um, and you can uh, actually translate this hydroxyapatite into a thin film form, not necessarily a bulk form and you can try to look at the strength of this hydroxyapatite films. And if we have a way to deposit as a thin film, then we can try to do it on variety of substrates. So, here is the situation where you have this target is nothing but your hydroxyapatite, hydroxyapatite and then you have the substrate you are uh, ablating using electron beam. Look at the progression of the plume. And this is actually a luminescing plume because all the ions in your hydroxyapatite, usually calcium, phosphorus, phosphorus, all these are actually fluorescing uh, 
and uh, once you trigger the pulse at 0 nanosecond this is how it is, but they specially grow with time and that is what you see here over a period of 3500 nanoseconds it has actually specially grown and you can see the zone the temperature zone and how the species are still luminescing over this transient period. And uh, during this uh, period, um, we also understand that the heavier particles and the lighter particles, they take their share to reach the substrate um, surface. And as a result, we can have a knowledge of how complex materials can be grown. Um, the mapping of these flashes gives us idea about the stoichiometry and how the plume dynamics can control the n stoichiometry of the film. This figure uh, gives us uh, the velocity distribution of the species corresponding to the image taken from the previous example of hydroxyapatite. As you would see here, um, the velocity distribution ranges from 0 to uh, 3 centimeter, which means um, you have both the high energy particles as well as low energy particles traveling together and the spectrum is quite large and this is the one which really makes the difference between PLD and PED. In PLD typically you would see the spectrum coming like this which means you do not have edge for high uh, for heavier species to travel and because you have the velocity distribution of the species quite large uh, it makes it more versatile for you to prepare um, films with less particulates. Uh, otherwise you will end up with the uh, uh, thin film with a lot of particle chunks also coming into picture. Because of this velocity distribution you get a much finer uh, film compared to PLD and I will show you some example of how it can go through. Uh, in this example you will see uh, zinc oxide for example if you operate with uh, the discharge voltage of 16 kV and external capacitor of uh, say 26 nanofarads, then what you see here is stoichiometric film, but many particulates are there, A lot of small small solids are seen on the SEM surface. But if you are going to change the discharge voltage and external capacitor, you would see for 1426 combination, stoichiometric film is there and it is smooth and very low number of particulates are there. And uh, you can also see the same combination works out for calcium phosphate, uh, zirconium tin uh, titanate, barium strontium titanate. In all these cases with a proper combination of your discharge voltage and uh, capacitor, uh, external capacitor, you can actually have a very smooth film coming out. This cartoon tells us what is the um, gamble with the stoichiometry. So, in such conditions um, what is the stoichiometry of the final film? For example, in this case this is a RBS Rutherford backscattering spectra of uh, your calcium phosphate which will actually estimate how much of calcium is there, how much of phosphorus is there and how much of uh, oxygen is there. So, you can technically evaluate your final composition based on the RBS channeling studies that is the advantage and as you would see the solid line here is nothing but your theoretical prediction and your dotted line is nothing but your experimental plot. In the case of PED film you would see that there is a very good match and uh, uh, both in the high energy region as well as in the low energy region, but notably you would see for a PLD film, there is a um, there is a problem of mismatch uh, for phosphorus, even for calcium here, and also there is a tailing in the low energy spectrum that is for oxygen. What does it mean compared to PLD? PED seems to give a very good film uh, stoichiometrically, and that you can see from the SEM uh, micrograph also. These are the small particulates that I was mentioning in the previous slide. So, this sort of small particulates are uh, there, but very minimum compared to PLD process.
uh, and therefore for complex materials uh, PED seems to be doing a better role and similarly if you look at zirconium tin titanate Z, ZST the RB spectrum is given for both PED deposited and the PLD deposited film as you can see here in this case there is some problem with the oxygen stoichiometry here but titanium and zirconium seems to be doing pretty well and uh, if you look at the PED oxygen stoichiometry is actually guaranteed there is no problem here as a result if you look at the SEM micrograph of the PED deposited film here and the SEM micrograph of the PLD deposited film you can see how the grain structure differs in other words uh, this surface seems to be relatively much more finer and smoother than the discontinuous grain growth in the PLD structure therefore there are a lot of advantages when we specially play around with uh, uh, complex materials PLD because of the energetics that is involved uh, it seems to have an edge over the PLD process in the case of PED the mechanism of interaction with the target is governed by electrons and not by uh, photons which is the main difference and thus the energy transfer to the target material is much much more effective um, in a PED process compared to PLD so wide gap band gap or highly reflective materials can be ablated with PED and uh, this is one of the reason why polymers can also be easily ablated using PED method in the case of wind band gap materials such as calcium phosphate it is also shown that the surface morphology of the films grown by PLD strongly depends on the target optical properties so any uh, optically uh, sensitive material uh, they will uh, actually depend on the optical absorption coefficient say alpha and if this alpha is not comparable then the material might throw some uh, plume but it is not actually ablating so um, you do not have this problem uh, in the case of PED because it does not depend the target does not depend on the optical absorption coefficient just depends on the uh, beam, uh, beam current and as a result beam energy therefore it is very easy to deposit optically active or materials which are um, optical materials so this is one of the reason why PLD is more favored I would like to give another example of zinc oxide that can be deposited with uh, PED deposition of zinc oxide is actually favored in substrates like alumina because aluminum oxide uh, in this case is actually sapphire we call it as uh, Al203 so you can deposit zinc oxide on alumina reason the zinc oxide is also HCP and it can easily grow on sapphire which is also HCP and if you look at the growth you would see only the 002 or 004 reflections of zinc oxide which means it is a C axis oriented growth so zinc oxide is actually growing on the C plane of your sapphire substrate therefore you would see only reflections of that and the way you see the intensity of your uh, um, C axis grown zinc oxide it clearly shows that they are very highly oriented thin films and uh, you can make epitaxial films out of it if you look at the cathodal luminescence that means you are trying to excite this zinc oxide film using a cathode then you can see this emission which is very typical of zinc oxide which approximately comes around 380 nanometers corresponds to 3.27 electron volt is clearly seen and this is a very useful input you get a very sharp emission although there is a camel back here which is approximately of the order of 550 nanometer and this camel back is usually due to the oxygen non stoichiometry nevertheless the band to band edge emission is very clearly seen using zinc oxide so you can make very good highly oriented zinc oxide films using PED.
as I told you in the previous slide this zinc oxide can be easily made uh, with very high degree of orientation. Um, there are factors that we need to bear in mind when we deposit zinc oxide. For example, uh, the beam energy parameter is actually given by this relationship and it goes as E is equal to C U square by 2 where C is your capacitor and uh, U is your discharge voltage. So, for a capacitor uh, external capacitor of 26 nanofarads and uh, beam voltage of 16 kV you would end up with a beam energy of 3.33 joules. So, if this were the case then the, you see several particulates are there in this film and this is not a smooth film therefore, this is not good for sensing properties. So, what you do you try to play around with the uh, capacitor uh, numbers and the discharge voltage. Suppose, I reduce the a discharge voltage from 16 to 14 then E 2 will be just 70 percent of your E 1. So, considerably you can bring down the beam energy from 3.3 to roughly around 2.9 uh, joules and once you do that you can clearly see the smoothness of the film uh, changes quite a bit. You can see here in B um, all the particulates are now um, vanishing and very few particulates are there. So, what you finally do you again try to bring down the external capacitor to 16 nanofarads and for this combination you see almost most of the particulates are avoided in zinc oxide film. Therefore, the beam parameter is very important you need to play around with this numbers to get the right response. So, the uh, film roughness is very critical to the uh, electron beam energy that you are choosing and uh, based on this you can see how the profile changes. Uh, if you are looking at a polycrystalline film for ZNO for example, the target to substrate distance plays an important role. If you are going to keep the distance at say 2 centimeter then, um, then you are seeing this um, 3 peak which is characteristic of zinc oxide to be more uh, broader in other words it is more amorphous. If you are going to keep it at 3 centimeter distance then the crystallinity improves and the best samples are made when the critical distance is at 4 centimeter. Therefore, each system has its own sensitivity we need to optimize that distance. This is a SEM image of uh, zinc oxide that is grown on silicon you can see how sharp interface you can build using pulse electron deposition. You can either make a polycrystalline zinc oxide film or single crystalline zinc oxide film depending on the substrate that you are choosing. And this is another example uh, by uh, Venkatesan's group at Maryland where they made a transparent conducting tin oxide films. Why are they used? Because for photonic applications you can now use a transparent electrode anode rather uh, which can replace indium tin oxide because of the cost that is involved tin oxide films are preferred and you can see here PED grown films show nearly 80 to 85 percent of optical transmission. In other words it is almost a clean uh, transparent electrode. So, you can get a very good transmission out of a PED uh, deposited one as comparable to PLD and uh, here also you look at the mapping of um, your tin oxide using mass bar. The isomer shift is exactly the same between PED and PLD that means, you can get a very good oriented film and uh, here again in B you can see the phi scan of all the reflections of zinc oxide and the rocking curve shows that the rocking curve full width half maxima is less than 1 degree that means, it is a very very nicely grown film using uh, PED method. And you would also see how PED is very critical to the processing gas. For example, this is a comparison made between PED and PLD. Uh, for 8 milliliter oxygen uh, pressure in combination with uh, uh, hydrogen, you can see the resistivity of your tin oxide. 
it is fairly low it is nearly metallic with a PLD, but for the same 8 millitor with PED you can see the resistance is of the order of 10 power 6. Therefore, the purging gas or uh, uh, the atmosphere that you use is very sensitive. Uh, so, you need to have an optimum for PED uh, process and similarly one can make very nicely grown film of gallia which is also useful for optoelectronic applications as you can see here. Uh, this is not exactly a single crystalline film, this is a polycrystalline film grown on sapphire substrates and the LASR MnO3 in the last lecture I mentioned how manganite films can be nicely grown and they show that critical metal insulated transition same is the case, uh, but again gives you an idea how the uh, transition metal insulated transition can change with uh, the gas that you use. In this case PED in argon gas gives you a metal insulated transition which is shifted by nearly 50 Kelvin whereas if you deposit this in gas uh, in uh, oxygen atmosphere you get a room temperature metallic film. So, uh, we can make even uh, manganite films with ease and this is the deposition chamber that we have at IIT. Uh, this facility is there and uh, we can try to grow films of a variety uh, on a variety of substrates. So, this is the processing chamber and this is the 6 target carousel that we have and the whole thing is actually triggered uh, using a computer uh, you can trigger the electron beam source and this is uh, one of the pictures taken uh, at IIT Kanpur where uh, you are ablating uh, manganite films and this is the typical plasma that is generated during the process. I will give you an example of how a polymer can be uh, uh, deposited. PTFE is a well known polymer which is uh, called Teflon and uh, to ablate a material like that is impossible using PLD because of the optical absorption coefficient which is quite quite, quite different. As a result it is not possible to ablate that easily using a PLD process, but you can see in PED you can deposit such a um, film and room temperature grown film shows the x-ray pattern which is typical of uh, the target and uh, suppose you grow the same film at 100 degree C you see a amorphous state and that is what you see from the TEM also you have a crystalline uh, film pattern emerging. How do I know because you are controlling in nano size it is very difficult to know whether you deposited any film or not. If you are going to deposit on a Teflon uh, coated glass uh, this is the tef Teflon coated glass and this is on um, uh, dr water droplets on glass you can clearly see that the contact angle changes uh, in the Teflon coated glass meaning you have made a very effective coating of Teflon on the glass. So, you can also see the IR uh, very clearly showing that PTFE can be made using PED and uh, in room temperature it gives a, a same feature like this, but when it is going to 100 degree C you can see a considerable loss in the fluorine content therefore, it is not really uh, Teflon, but it is actually a non stoichiometric uh, polymer film and this is the SEM of the target you can see a very nicely um, uh, cut uh, solid surface um, of a polymer and uh, the microstructure changes when you try to deposit this film uh, with different temperatures um, and uh, this is another example of how the um, crystallinity of the polymer varies from room temperature to 100 to 300 and to 500. Although the x-ray remains the same it is very tempting to conclude that I am making a PTFE film, but as you see here you go uh, down this SEM features you can clearly see the microstructure changes which means when you deposit or when you post anneal this uh, films at higher temperature you are actually losing quite amount of uh, fluorine. Uh, so, care should be taken to optimize the condition and if you go to 500 actually the compound has transformed into uh, mere carbon. So, what you see here is nothing but uh, uh, carbon. So, 
uh, we need to understand this uh, dynamics uh, closely when you deposit PED and it is also possible for us to gauge what is the thickness of this film that you are making and using a profilometer it is possible to measure exactly the thickness of your PTFE layers. This is a typical AFM uh, image of the film and we can also do some nanostructuring. You can write um, IIT Kanpur uh, as a nanostructure and uh, length and width of each line is 1 micron and 44 nanometer respectively. So, you can actually do this sort of writings on polymer films. It is possible once you write using electron beam, you can try to cap this with any sort of um, dopants. So, you can actually try to fabricate any device by nanostructuring these polymeric surfaces. And this is another uh, effort where you can use PED to make devices. I want to make a spintronic device, then I can actually go through this protocol. I first take a glass electrode like this 5 mm by 5 mm and I can put a stripe. The first black stripe what you see here is nothing but iron stripe and on the iron stripe I can actually put a PTFE uh, square uh, layer and then on the top of the PTFE layer I can put another iron stripe. So, this is iron electrode and ion electrode and uh, uh, PTFE is sandwiched between two ion electrodes. So, the AFM of each of this layer is shown on the top. You can see the microstructure is varying. Uh, the microstructure of the top electrode is quite different from bottom electrode because you are heating this sample during deposition at 250 degree C. Therefore, you get a fine grained uh, structure compared to amorphous uh, room temperature grown film. So, once you make this film, you can actually measure the resistance by applying voltage across uh, these two ends and you can measure the, you can apply current across this and measure the voltage across these two leads. So, this way you can uh, make a plot of resistivity and before that if you take a look at the individual layers. Uh, you can see the bottom and the top layers do show different coercivity and in a device they typically show this two step loop and this two step loop is very critical or characteristic that a device is made. Uh, meaning the electrons are now tunneling through the polymeric layer and only then you will see this sort of a two loop situation. But if you actually measure for that, that device with the, the polymer thickness varying from 3 nanometer to 4 nanometer, what you really see is pinholes which are short circuiting the top and the bottom electrode. As a result, you get a magneto resistance which is negative in nature. If it is negative, that means there is a short circuiting between this electrode and this electrode uh, via pinholes which are formed by PTFE. Therefore, this is not the desirable one. Therefore, what I can do is I can increase this layer thickness of PTFE which is in the middle and if I increase it to say 6 nanometer then I immediately you see the magneto resistance switches to positive in nature which means the device is actually operating. So, uh, this is a very uh, useful information to understand how PED can be used for making critical devices. It is not just making films, you can make devices and how do I know that I have made a device? If you actually do R versus T plot, typical values of your uh, resistance has to be uh, something like this, say 95 ohms. What does it mean? Um, the ion electrodes are actually delinked, therefore resistance has gone up. If through the uh, pinholes they are short circuited, the resistance will be less than a ohm, it will be in milli ohm. That means, both the electrodes are in contact with each other. Therefore, resistance will give you a useful map whether your device is really uh, flat and it is working or not. So, uh, PED can help us make films like this and this is incidentally one of the good examples of a, a tunneling magneto resistance curve. Lastly, I would like to show some example of yttrium barium copper which is a superconductor and how this can be deposited and uh, Christian group 
uh, have reported how this can be made not just as a film, but as a tape because for practical applications you need to use it as a tape and this is the profile where they have used it as you can see uh, this is not just a substrate, but this is a polymer tape material uh, called a rabbit. Uh, so, rabbit tapes are nickel tungsten tapes which can be rotated like a reel uh, and uh, as the reel is being rotated you can try to deposit uh, yttrium barium copper on the uh, substrate and therefore, you can do a reel to reel deposition which is one of the biggest advantage with PD process this cannot be done with these with a PLD instrument. So, there, that way you can actually make a substantially good application oriented depositions using PED and uh, you can also map depending on the pulse uh, time deposition time how the composition varies this should be your actual composition 1 is to 1.6 is to 3 for yttrium barium copper and as you are keeping on um, pulsing uh, you can stop at some counts and see what is the composition as you would see copper does not suffer in stoichiometry, but there is a give and take between yttrium and barium as you keep on progressively depositing high T C films. So, you need to have some idea how the chemical composition can vary and also the distance between target and uh, um, the substrate uh, is determined if you are going to uh, keep it at 6 centimeter you can see the T C is varying as a function of uh, uh, millitor of oxygen partial pressure. If you are going to keep it at 7, then you can see the, you can achieve a good stoichiometric film uh, even below 50 millitor. So, all this uh, are very sensitive and one depends on the other. Therefore, depending on the system, we need to uh, make a compromise and these are some of the uh, superconducting films. These are the actual plots of yttrium barium copper oxide as you see a typical superconductor will show a metallic behavior and then it drops down to 0 uh, shows absolute resistivity at 90 K and such films can be easily grown with PED technique. Uh, so, in one sense we can sort of map to understand that for various compositions you need various mapping. Um, if you are going to use alumina target probably the distance or the target mount has to be like this. If you are going to use a copper plate then you need to have go for a uh, probe like this. Uh, so, different mounting approaches are also useful depending on the sort of material that we are using and this also gives us some idea about um, the peak signal and the number of pulses as you can see here. Um, you can easily do it for copper whereas, when we go for alumina targets um, the uh, ion probe peak voltage is fairly low and uh, if you want to achieve uh, 1 angstrom per pulse then you need to sufficient uh, sufficiently go for a compromise even on the uh, target mounting approach. So, all these are very important when we try to look at uh, PD process. So, to sum up uh, some word of uh, uh, comparison between PED and PLD. Um, PED is uh, having its own limitations in terms of the stringent uh, parameters that are uh, critically linked between each other. For example, target distance, uh, the amount of uh, uh, or the uh, millitor of uh, uh, the gas that you are uh, using the nature of gas that you are using and then the probe voltage uh, electron beam that is coming and uh, how uh, how the distance is kept between the target and um, uh, the substrate all these are very sensitive. Uh, in case of PLD this is not too critical though uh, the partial pressure of the oxygen or organ is very critical in PLD process. So, with a fair amount of understanding it is possible to extend PED process to a variety of uh, useful applications and therefore, uh, more studies will be done especially for device applications using PED. So, with this I stop.